Okay, the next case set for argument is State of Ohio versus Aaron uh, Krogan. It's case number 29290. The State of Ohio has waived oral arguments, so we, we will just be hearing from Attorney Smith on behalf of uh, Ms. Krogan. Uh, you will have 15 minutes to present your argument, and we've read the briefs and are prepared to proceed if you are. Attorney Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Your Honors, there were several evidentiary issues in this case. Uh, first, uh, the trial court erred in admitting Facebook posts that were allegedly made by, by the defendant, and the appellant, Aaron Crow. These Facebook posts, there was never any testimony presented from Facebook itself to authenticate these posts. Uh, this, was a, this matter was actually discussed on the record before, I believe it was before the trial began. And uh, Attorney Laybourn brought up this argument. There was never any subpoena issued to Facebook. There was never any testimony presented from officials at Facebook to authenticate these posts. So it was just an officer who indicated they went to Ms. Grogan's Facebook page and screenshotted it? it was, yeah, well, Your Honor, it was actually the, the uh, principal. Oh, the principal. Of, the yes. Principal, yeah. Yeah. Okay, went to the Tina Facebook Lawrence. page and screenshot it. Yes, she she took screenshots of the Facebook posts and she testified she testified I made these I did these screenshots here they are. The problem is that testimony is not enough to authenticate those posts because there was never a clear time signature issued as to exactly when these posts were made. Uh, with the way that the Facebook posts are made is it posts them in, in terms of how long ago they were uh, the Facebook post didn't say they were posted on, you know, just a, a, a example, September 20th at 2 o'clock. But doesn't, doesn't, it, but doesn't that, isn't that evidence that it is a Facebook post by Ms. Krogan? It is what it purports to be under 901, and that doesn't burden shift to the defendant to show that it's not genuine or authentic. I don't believe, we don't believe that burden was met in this particular case, Your Honor. The the witness didn't actually see Aaron Krogan make these posts. Uh, this is, she's, uh, based on her testimony, she's sitting on her computer, she sees these posts come in, they were made at some point, you know, it's, it's in some relation of time before she took these screenshots, obviously, but she never says, I was sitting on my computer on this date, at this time, I see these posts come in, and, and this is when I took the screenshots. Now, what the way she tried to link these to a particular time was, she would screenshot the she would screenshot the post and then save the file on a disk, and then they were saved onto a disk. The disk had a time signature purporting to be approximately when she took the screenshot. The problem with that feature is, as anybody knows, you can right click on a file and click rename to make it end, and you can change the, the name of the file to anything you want. So that doesn't conclusively establish when these when these screenshots were taken. Did the officer testify that in his interchange with um, Ms. Krogan that she admitted that she had made these posts? Uh, there, there was some testimony to that effect, Your Honor. However, the exact, uh, I don't believe that Breed, Deputy Breeden's testimony established the content of the post. Norris's te the, the state needed Norris's testimony to establish the content of the post. And that's what they relied very heavily upon because she was the one who was basically carried the, carried the load of, of trying to authenticate these posts as part of the state's case. Breeden never testified. I mean, Let me ask this a different way. Did the defendant offer any evidence to rebut the authenticity of the post? Did she say, I didn't post this material? There, there wasn't testimony on the record that she did not post it. However, under 901, the state has to meet its, its threshold burden of, of authentication, and, then, and only then does the burden shift to the defense to rebut that presumption. So, well, so the the burden was not met here just because Norris didn't see Krogan make these posts. There was never 
testimony establishing exactly what time the screenshots were taken other than these time signatures which could have easily been changed. That burden was not met in this particular case. Pretty low burden. Authenticity is not a, I mean, it's, the case law is clear, it's a low burden to me. Do you have any case, I mean, Facebook's been around for a while now. Do you have any case law that would indicate it was necessary to call uh, somebody from Facebook or somebody from the internet provider to link the post to her IP address, et cetera? I believe there was a case out of the, I, and I believe that uh, defense counsel cited this. There was a, the only case, and I actually did my own research trying to find a case where a, a court had dealt with this issue since Facebook is such a recent innovation. I believe there was one case out of the 6th District that touched on this issue. And I, uh, is it in your brief? I, I believe it is in the brief. Okay. There, uh, but there was one case out of the 6th District, I believe, that dealt with this. And I believe Attorney Laybourne cited it as well. And I, I believe it was, I believe that they had indicated that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the name of it escaped. Oh, that's okay, it's in your brief. I, I believe it is, it is in there, or I can do a supplemental brief if necessary. But the, um, but the, basically, the Facebook doesn't, uh, the screen, the screenshots have to be authenticated somehow. I mean, that, that information can be obtained with metadata from Facebook. The state did not make any effort to subpoena that data. They could have sent a subpoena to Facebook and <coughs> even received records by mail that, you know, cert certified copies of records that could have allowed them to authenticate this in some other way, and they cho chose not to go that route. And that, that, leaves that, ins that leaves what they had insufficient as a matter of Yes, and yes, Your Honor. And uh, with respect to the sufficiency, the states uh, spent quite a bit of time and, and called several witnesses. They were trying to portray the the supposed reaction to these Facebook posts as more than it actually was. Uh, I think that that it really boiled down to they had several witnesses from the Coventry School District testify. Uh, they try to portray the reaction uh, from the from the public and from parents as much more overt or overblown than it was. Uh, I believe at one point uh, the uh, one of the school officials testified that she received about in the ballpark of 15 phone calls. Well, when you take that, it sounds like a high number. However, when you take it in the context of a typical day where she's on the phone all day, it it kind of diminishes the the you know diminishes the amount in content in the context of what would be expected during a typical day. Uh, I believe at another point, another official testified that there were a few parents that had questions. Well, a few <coughs> a few parents is not enough to establish a serious public inconvenience or alarm. And, uh, and so I think that the testimony from these witnesses is not sufficient to establish that even if for the sake of argument, these posts were made by Krogan, that it caused that serious public inconvenience or alarm. And so, when, um, just so I understand the argument, the um, we're talking about posts subsequent to the first, hey, did anyone hear some child had brought a firearm to the school at some time in the past? Okay. Right. So the, 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 is it, the state's theory was um, that the, the inducing panic came from posts made subsequent to that one. Or I, that, I'm trying to understand the state's theory of, uh, at trial. Maybe the record will be clear. Krogan made it clear from the beginning that this all took place in the past, that this was not an this was not an ongoing emergency. This was not, there's a kid with a gun in the school right now. This was all in the past tense. And she made that clear. I mean, that was clear even in the initial Facebook post. Did it, was anybody aware that some somebody brought a gun to school back in November? And this was done in February. 
So this was at least three months, three months or so, or, or two or three months removed from, from what she's purporting or what she's saying took place. Would the, um, well, sure, right. were the subsequent posts related to an alleged cover-up situation or were they related to this incident of a, a firearm in the school itself? There was some reference the, the Facebook posts appear, uh, appear to reference, uh, take the position that the school officials were not being entirely forthcoming about what took place. It, 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 doesn't move the, it doesn't move the dial or move the gauge as far as sufficiency of the evidence because either way it's referencing a past event. They're not, now if she had, now if it had been a situation where she says, well, there may have been a gun brought in today and the, and the principal's covering it up. Now, that could possibly support more of a theory under that, you know, under that set of facts. Is that set of facts present in this? No. No, this, uh, this was, pro, uh, the, the Facebook posts are talking about she wasn't honest about what happened before. And I, I think that's a very important distinction because most of the case law talks about where some where a person is convicted of inducing panic talks about an, uh, a present or imminent or ongoing emergency. I believe there was one case out of the case out of I uh, cited out of the eighth district where someone calls in a bomb threat to a to a government office or someone threatens to shoot up an office or there's some sort of imminent danger or some sort of imminent threat that leads to that leads to that charge that didn't take place here and in fact there's very little case law that talks about you know reporting a past emergency as, as, as enough to induce panic and i think that really sets this case apart from all of the other cases from, that have involved the charge of inducing panic where you know she's making it clear from the very beginning this was something that already took place it's not happening now it's not a present emergency. It's not a present danger to anyone. This is something that happened before, and I want to make people aware. Well, let me ask you this. Um, so I'm, I'm a parent who had a child in that school, and I hear that in the past that um, a firearm was in the school. And um, I never heard from the school about this before, but I'm going to send my child to school tomorrow not knowing if the school is diligent in monitoring what's coming in and out. Can that be enough to induce a panic? In other words, you know, I, I, I want to know if the, if the uh, school is doing its job to keep my child safe while the child, the child is in school. Not in the fact, context of this particular case, Your Honor, because the, at this point there's no, there's no clear and present emergency or, or imminent danger. That, that would lead to that would lead to a panic. Obviously, different people are going to react to this in different ways. Obviously, if I'm a parent, I'm thinking the same thing. You know, why why didn't they tell us? It do, it still doesn't rise to the level of inducing a serious public inconvenience or alarm. Now, could it be a matter of inquiry for a parent toward the school district? Possibly. I in this particular context, though, based on the case law and based on the reading of the reading of the statute, <coughs> it would not rise to that level. Because, because, of the, because of the language in the post making it clear that this was a path, this was an event that had already occurred, and it was no longer a, an ongoing emergency. So it might, be a, it might be a matter of, you know, public debate, it might be a matter of, you know, a matter of inquiry, something to bring up at the next school board meeting, something to call the principal about. Is it something that is it something that's going to rise to the level of a serious public inconvenience or alarm? No, not under the current definition. What was the testimony concerning the nature of the calls that were received after the post was made? The, there was some testimony that said. Uh, they talked about uh, some of the parents were pretty nervous uh, when they called in. They were, uh, they were, I, I believe they were described as nervous or fearful at, at different times. However, it has to be taken into account of, it had, we, we don't know what those parents actually heard. 
We don't know if those parents actually saw the Facebook post. The, the, what the parents related, they don't discuss what the parents actually related to the principal. For example, the parent called in and said, I, I read this Facebook post and I saw this. It's different from a parent who says, I heard this through another person. So we don't know actually we don't know what actually caused them to feel that way, or, or we don't know if they actually saw the Facebook post or if this was second or third hand information they got from another person, for which you know which would would not be the conduct that would meet the criteria of the statute. Mr. Smith, thank you for your arguments. You've used your time. Um, we will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The clerk, of course, will mail you a copy of the court's decision on the day it's released. You can also uh, check the Ohio Supreme Court's website where the decisions are, or the opinions are also posted. Uh, thank you for coming in today and arguing. All right.